This series is sponsored by our organization, the State Historical Society, with support from the University of Missouri's Office of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity. This lecture series began during the winter semester 2016 in response to the Concerned Student 1950 movement of the previous semester. We launched this lecture series in an effort to add context to the ongoing discussion about race in our state's history. Over the course of the past six plus years, we have hosted more than 20 programs on various aspects of the black experience in Missouri, from slavery to the civil rights movement, from, from black cultural and educational institutions to black businesses and the all black city of Kinloch. All of these programs, by the way, you can see by logging into our website, shsmo.org. Our hope is to continue this lecture series into the far distant future. This evening's lecture is presented by Dr. Larry Gregg, Curator's Distinguished Teaching Professor of History Emeritus and Historian at Missouri University of Science and Technology in on the faculty uh, in the Department of History and Political Science between 1977 and 2021, Larry served as department chair for 17 of those years. <coughs> Excuse me. He is the author of 10 books, including Forged in Gold, Missouri S&T's First 150 Years. While his research has ranged from the Puritan and Quaker eras, uh, he was a colonial historian here as a graduate student in the early 1970s uh, to the history of Las Vegas. Recently, he has been focused upon important developments in the history of his home institution with two articles published in our Missouri Historical Review. One from the Hell's Brew of Malice, Hatred, and Vindictiveness. Where did you come up with that title? <laughs> The 1906 Investigation of George E. Ladd, Director of the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy, which was published in October 2020, and Doing Some Good, George Horn's Role in the 1950 Desegregation of the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy and the University of Missouri. That was in October 2021. So you owe us one. Uh, it's October 2022. Uh, Tonight's presentation is titled, What Are You Going to Do If a Negro Student Presents Himself for Registration in the Fall? Missouri College and University Presidents Respond to Demands for Desegregation in 1950. Please join me in welcoming my good friend, Professor Murray Gregg. Uh, historians can't do their work unless they're really good archivists and manuscript specialists. And I want to thank several. At, at Missouri s and our archivist, Debbie Griffith, who found so much material for me, and at the Rolla Research Center of the State Historical Society, Katie Seeley and Carol Goggin, and then a whole string of others who've been really helpful. At, at Missouri State University, Tracy Gieselman, France, at Lincoln University, Ithaca Bryant, at Southeast Missouri State, Tyson Koenig, at Northwest Missouri State, Jessica Vest, at the University of Central Missouri, uh, Amber Clifford Napoleon, at Truman State, Amanda Lugendorfer, at the Library of Congress, Chamisa Redmond, and at the University of Tennessee, Kyle Hovius. So with all the material that they've provided for me, I can talk about <clears throat> this intriguing topic of what happened in 1950, right before 1950, during 1950, and just after it. In his recent book, the Campus Color Line, College Presidents and the Struggle for Black Freedom, Eddie R. Cole wrote the following. The college presidency is a prism through which to disclose how colleges and universities have challenged or preserved the many enduring forms of anti-black racism in the United States. However, he adds in the book, college presidents during the mid 20th century fight for racial equality remain virtually nameless when we remember higher education's role in the civil rights struggle. 
but not Missouri. Not Missouri. Because of an abundance of relevant primary sources, it's possible to examine how the leaders of higher education in Missouri responded to demands for desegregation in public colleges and universities. In 1950, a Cole County Circuit Court order directed the Missouri School of Mines in Rolla and the University of Missouri in Columbia to permit African-American students who wanted a degree program not offered at Lincoln University to attend the Rolla and Columbia campuses. Prior to and after that decision, all presidents of the state colleges, in addition to the presidents at Lincoln University and the University of Missouri, faced increasing demands to end all segregation at public institutions. Now, what you're going to hear is their collective responses. And those collective responses reflected a cautious, sometimes pragmatic, and often indifferent approach to the most important challenge facing higher education in mid-century. Now, these seven presidents I'm going to look at, here they are, were all veteran leaders of their institutions. Their average age was 58, and five of them had a PhD. All had their terminal degree from excellent institutions like Columbia University, the George Peabody College for Teachers in Nashville, Indiana University, the University of Kansas, and the University of Michigan. And most of them were excellent scholars who had published books in their areas of expertise. They had dealt with a wide range of challenges from keeping their institutions functioning during the Great Depression and to handling the post-war flood of students funded by the GI Bill. Clearly, all seven were accustomed to dealing with really complex problems. In fact, except for Walter Ryle at Northeast Missouri State Teachers College, the state college presidents had steered their institutions through another step in the evolution from a normal state school to state colleges. Parker and Deemer, two of these presidents up here, had been a member of the Board of Trustees of the American Association of Teachers Colleges. President Middlebush had been a member of the Board of Trustees of the Carnegie Foundation, and he served as president of the National Association of State Universities. In short, all seven of these men were substantial leaders leading colleges and universities in a state still much divided over race. In the 1950 census, most of Missouri's 290,000 black residents lived in either Jackson County, St. Louis, or St. Louis County. None of the state's public higher education institutions were in those urban areas. And what you see in that next slide is the county population in 1950. Whether they lived in rural or urban areas, the black population faced discrimination in jobs, public accommodations, housing, and education. Rolla, for example, where I'm from, had a one-room schoolhouse, the Lincoln School, the building's still in Rolla, they've just taken the name off, it's attached to a, to a church. If those children who went there and their parents wished to worship, they did so in the Elkins Methodist Church, which was just a block from the Lincoln School. Because of restrictive covenants, most black families lived in the blocks adjacent to the church and the school. Black guests were not welcome in the town's hotels and motels, and the only place to have a meal was one table reserved for them in the bus depot. George Kirk who in 1944 was a delegate to the State Constitutional Convention from Sykeston, explained why he opposed the demands that public education be desegregated. Kirk said, Missouri is still a southern state in sentiment. It is still south of the Mason-Dixon line, and the people are not now ready for a change like this. Similarly, six years later, a Rolla resident wrote a letter to the editor of the School of Mines paper, the Missouri Miner, to explain why restaurant owners in town resisted integration. He wrote, Missouri is a border state, and merchants would go broke in 30 days if they were to cater to Negroes. Well, then the Board of Curators for the University of Missouri issued this statement in 1948. You can read along with me. 
They recognized this reality when they pointed out that the separation of whites and Negroes for the purpose of education is a studied, deliberate policy ratified and approved any times by the people of Missouri and their authorized representatives. And they're right. The 1865, 1875, and 1945 state constitutions had stipulated that Missouri would have segregated public schools. Now, African-American residents wishing to attend a state college or university could only be admitted to Lincoln University in Jefferson City. For those seeking a professional or graduate degree, the state offered a scholarship to students accepted by an integrated institution in another state. Now, governors of this era and the state legislators believe that these accommodations enabled Missouri to comply with the 1896 Plessy versus Ferguson decision that required that segregated facilities be substantially equal to those provided to white citizens. Now, there was a court case that forced state legislatures, legislators to revise this minimalist approach to meeting the requirements of the Plessy decision. In 1936, Lloyd Gaines, a graduate of Lincoln University, applied for admission to the University of Missouri School of Law. And by the way, if you want to pick a book to start reading about this topic of the 1930s, 40s, early 50s, you can do no better than the wonderful book by uh, Enders and Horner, which is a terrific book on the Lloyd Gaines case. Gaines lawyers provided by the NAACP were unsuccessful in Missouri courts, but in 1938, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that Missouri had failed to meet the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment by forcing Gaines to pursue a law degree in another state. In response, state legislators appropriated funds for Lincoln to establish a law school for African American students in St. Louis, which opened in 1939. That same year, Lucille Bluford, she's up in the slide on the right, the managing editor of the African American Kansas City Call newspaper, who had a degree in journalism from the University of Kansas, applied for admission to the University of Missouri graduate program in journalism. When the university refused, Bluford filed several unsuccessful lawsuits. Eventually, Lincoln University opened a program in journalism. Now, while all this is going on, Throughout the, the 30s and 1940s, no public or college president openly advocated an end to segregation in higher education in Missouri except Sherman Scruggs at Lincoln University, who in 1947 said the following, open the doors of all Missouri colleges to anyone who meets the educational standards. Yet, in testimony before the state legislature two years later, Scruggs undercut the power of his appeal in an apparent effort to reassure legislators that desegregation would not lead to a flood of black students to the currently segregated institutions. He said to a House committee, members of his race would want to go to white schools only when the courses they desired couldn't be studied at Lincoln because, he said, most Negroes are much happier among themselves. Now, three decisions from the U.S. Supreme Court between 1948 and 1950 dramatically changed the situation in Missouri. In its 1948 decision, CPO versus Board of Regents of the State of Oklahoma, the justices ruled that the University of Oklahoma School of Law, which had rejected the application of Ada Lois CPO, must not only admit her but also must provide legal education as soon as it does to applicants of any other group. This decision, along with the judgment in the Gaines case, had, according to historian Gary Lavernier, provided legal conditions for what was acceptably separate. In the Gaines case, the separate facilities had to be within the state. In CPO, the separate facilities had to be offered at the same time. In June 1950, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in Sweat v. Painter that the state of Texas had not met the requirement of providing a substantially equivalent legal education for African American students by establishing, as Missouri had done, a separate law school. Indeed, the newly established law school for African American students not only had fewer faculty, a smaller library, 
and moot court facilities that also lacked the prestige of the well-established law school for white students. Likewise, in June 1950, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in McLaren versus Oklahoma State Regents that the University of Oklahoma had violated the Equal Protection Clause after admitting George McLaren to a graduate program in education. Look at that photo. The institution literally had required him to be separate from the white students in the classroom, the library, the cafeteria, and the restrooms. There was a designated table for him in the library, a designated table in the cafeteria. Well, within this context, President Frederick Middlebush, because he headed the state university in Missouri, faced several challenges to the institution's enforcement of segregation even for extracurricular activities. In 1939, for example, the Tigers canceled a scheduled track meet with the University of Wisconsin and Notre Dame because Wisconsin had a black hurdler named Ed Smith. Besides criticism in the press, some student groups on the Columbia campus protested the decision, and Middlebush received six critical letters, most from alumni. Those who took the time to write condemned the intolerance and the racial bigotry of a, quote, so-called liberal institution. Alumnus John Shea, who was the editor of a publication for the National Education Association, wrote this sentence. This is the first time I've been ashamed of the fact that I grew up in Missouri and that I attended MU. Middlebush remained unmoved, as is clear the following year when New York University could not bring their ha black halfback Leonard Bates for a football game in Columbia. The decision concerning Bates reflected the policy of the Big Six Conference, which included Missouri, Kansas, Kansas State, Nebraska, Iowa State, and Oklahoma. The conference, through the influence of the University of Missouri and the University of Oklahoma, prohibited participation by black athletes on all varsity teams. While faculty representatives apparently drove these decisions, President Middlebush's pivotal role was evident in a comment from Robert Stearns, the president of the University of Colorado, after his institution joined the conference, making it the Big Seven. Stearns believed that if he and his fellow presidents, quote, put a little pressure on Middlebush, we will get there in eliminating the ban on black players. In 1947, Middlebush offered an explanation for his rigid stance on segregation on activities not associated with enrollment of black students at his university. That year, the University of Missouri hosted an intercollegiate United Nations conference. Students from over 20 Missouri public and private two-year and four-year colleges attended. However, Middlebush banned the students from three black institutions, Lincoln University, Stowe Teachers College in St. Louis, and Lincoln Junior College in Kansas City. I admit, he told a reporter, that the exclusion of Negroes detracts from the universal character of the United Nations Conference, and it weakens that conference. However, as I interpret the constitutional provision for separate schools, I believe it also calls for segregation and affairs of this nature. Well, the journalist looked up the 1945 state constitution, and he quoted it. Separate schools shall be provided for white and colored children. Not a syllable of that sentence suggests that Negroes must be barred from student conferences or from visits to campus. Yet Middlebush was resolute, not willing to retreat, which was a trait he frequently exhibited. Indeed, Alan P. Green, who served a term as president of the University of Missouri Board of Visitors, characterized Middlebush as, quote, a stubborn Holland Dutchman, a man of such a nature that you must be forceful in dealing with him. Well, in April 1950, Roy Ellis, who was the president at Southwest Missouri State College, also faced a public challenge to his institution's policies. Sigma Pi fraternity had hired an all-white orchestra to perform at a scheduled dance, as well as a black singer named John Harper, Jr. The college's dean, Willard Graff, told the fraternity that they could not have Harper appear, quote, because it would be in violation of long-established college policy. Two days later, 
The Springfield chapter of the NAACP sent a letter to both President Ellis and the institution's Board of Regents. The letter not only protested the barring of the black singer at a fraternity, but also noted that Negroes are discriminated against by not being able to attend Southwest Missouri State College. The day after the NAACP sent their letter, fraternity members at Sigma Pi were awakened early in the morning by flames leaping from a gasoline-saturated cross on their lawn. Later in the morning, the college's Board of Regents issued a policy statement in response to the, quote, ticklish race problem reflected in the cross burning. It was promised that no entertainer would be banned in the future because of his race. NAACP Chapter President Landon Smith reported to the national office, we had the support of two radio stations, newspapers, and a majority of the student body. In the aftermath of these developments, President Ellis told reporters he regarded the race issue as simply custom and tradition, and he viewed the cross burning as little more than a regrettable prank. As Middlebush and Ellis publicly responded to questions about their institution's policies, the five state college presidents conducted substantial conversations about their challenges in dozens of letters. And these are, this is a collection of letters that are housed in the uh, special collections and archives at Missouri State University. These documents, not meant to be public, reveal much about their collective response to calls for desegregation. In December of 1948, a hearing conducted by a newly established House Equal Rights Committee triggered much discussion among the state college presidents. At that hearing, David McReynolds, who was the president of the University of Missouri Board of Curators, urged House members to pass a law to permit the admission of Negro students to state-supported institutions of higher education in those divisions where instruction afforded by Lincoln University is not equivalent to the instruction given by state schools. All five state college presidents had been invited to attend, but none did. When asked for a comment about the hearing, Roy Ellis simply declined. However, over the next two years, Ellis and the other four state college presidents exchanged numerous letters in which they discussed what to do if courts ordered desegregation. Between 19, December of 48 and March of 49, the presidents focused upon who should decide whether or not public higher education in Missouri should be desegregated. The presidents all agreed that they would be best served by not leading the way on this question. As Ellis wrote, we should not attempt to dictate civil rights legislation. President John Jones of Northwest Missouri State explained that his Board of Regents had instructed him to leave the matter in the hands of the General Assembly. That was fine with Central Missouri State President George Deemer, who expressed no opinion on the virtues or the disadvantages of desegregated higher education when he wrote, I think maybe we should just leave it all alone and then conform to whatever comes out. Collectively, they were grateful that the ultimate decision was out of their hands. As Roy Ellis put it, there was nothing that he could do because the Board of Regents determined the institution's policies. In other words, I'm just a servant of the board. But then, Cole County Circuit Court Judge Sam Blair ordered the Missouri School of Mines to admit George E. Horn and Elmer Bell Jr. And here they write a letter of thanks to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch for all the support that the Post-Dispatch had given them. They were uh, ordered to be admitted into the engineering degree programs at Rolla, and the University of Missouri must admit Gus Ridgel into the graduate program in economics. This decision came down on June 28, 1950. Well, the five state college presidents shared not only their opinions on this case, but also the opinions of their governing boards on the implications for their institutions. President Deemer was in the minority in concluding, my own opinion is that the bars are pretty well down and I wish Judge Blair had gone all the way and said that any qualified student should be admitted to any of the state schools without regard to race or color. However, after consulting their governing boards and their college attorneys, the other presidents concluded that the Blair decision should have no impact on how they conduct their business. Walter Parker, the president of Southeast Missouri State, 
offered the most direct analysis. In describing Blair's decision, Parker wrote, In other words, whether or not our institutions are under the necessity of admitting colored people was no more before Judge Blair than was the atomic theory, the nebular hypothesis, or who is to be admitted to the University of Wisconsin. Still, it was not clear to them how they should deal with any prospective black students who will seek admissions to their college. As Walter Ralph from Northeast Missouri State put it, we should establish a common policy. That is, what are we going to do if a Negro asks admission to one of our colleges this fall? Roy Ellis recommended, and the others agreed, that about all we can say to any Negro is no. And if he insisted, refer it to the courts. Whatever happened, they were hopeful they could avoid newspaper coverage of their decisions. In early July, Walter Parker told his fellow presidents he had not been contacted by the local newspaper in Cape Girardeau, and I am glad that I've not been under pressure for giving them a statement. Two weeks later, President Deemer hoped for a similar outcome. He wrote, I want no newspaper publicity nor court action if I can avoid it. President Jones at Northwest worked to evade public notice of any decision that his board of regents made. Even after the Brown decision in 1954, Jones worked with his board to secure a resolution that should Northwest Missouri State admit a Negro student, they would do so without publicity. In this regard, the college president shared the wish of Frederick Middlebush a year earlier. In 1949, when William Hogsett, the University of Missouri's lead attorney in its desegregation cases, recommended that Middlebush take a more active role in identifying some possible appropriate black students for admission, Middlebush wrote the following reply. I do think it would be a serious mistake for any official connected with the university to lay himself open to the charge that we took the initiative in starting such a case. Roy Ellis, however, could not avoid the glare of the spotlight. He told his fellow presidents that he believed because his community had a very active NAACP chapter that Southwest Missouri State would be the chosen spot for a test case. Indeed, in less than a month following the Blair decision, according to the Springfield Leader and Press, two young Negro men who wanted to enroll at SMS, quote, met with a polite refusal from President Ellis. The two men, the Reverend C.B. Bryant and Allison Smart, told Ellis that the local chapter of the NAACP had encouraged them to seek admission. According to the news story, Ellis told the Board of Regents told the two men that his Board of Regents had studied the Blair decision carefully and found there was virtually no difference between programs offered by Lincoln and by the college here. Therefore, he could not accept them. But it got a little more challenging for Ellis in October. In October, Mary Jean Price, she's on the extreme right there, Price, who was the salutatorian at Lincoln High School in Springfield, wanted to become a school librarian. She had contacted Lincoln and learned that the Jefferson City University, quote, does not offer and does not at this time contemplate offering any courses in library science. Thus, following the logic of the Blair decision, she argued that Southwest Missouri State must accept her application because it offered the coursework that she sought. The Board of Regents referred her letter to the college attorney Frank C. Mann, who also was on the University of Missouri Board of Curators, through two meetings, board members and Mann considered Price's application. While they deliberated, President Ellis wrote to Lincoln's president, Sherman Scruggs, asking if his institution currently offered or had plans to offer the courses Mary Jean Price sought. To Ellis's great relief, Scruggs replied that Lincoln had begun offering libraries science classes that summer, and they were going to offer 15 hours of subject matter in the next academic year. Once Ellis shared this news with his board members, they voted to reject Price's application. Ellis, believing that his institution was the victim in this instance, not Mary Jean Price, wrote to his fellow presidents, from our standpoint, it is an uncomfortable situation for this college to be made the guinea pig in this matter. 
Well, in addition to their concerns about the possibility of being required to accept black students, these five college presidents pondered whether or not to allow visiting teams to have black players on the rosters. President Jones asked his colleagues if they were willing to schedule an athletic contest with a college that you know uses Negroes on their team. Two responded. President Deemer at Central Missouri State recommended letting team members decide. He recalled that in previous years when Central played teams from Kansas, that the football team voted unanimously to play without discriminating because of Negro players. Deemer expected that to continue. Prior to 1948, according to Walter Parker at Southeast Missouri State, uh, they had been vetoing the use of Negroes in games in Cape Girardeau. However, he wrote, in the past two years when Southern Illinois University brought black players on their football team for games in Cape, there were no repercussions. He did not know what would happen in a basketball game. But so far as football is concerned, it is no longer a problem with us. Now, other than that one exchange of letters I mentioned between Roy Ellis and Sherman Scruggs, the president of Lincoln was rarely involved in this correspondence. Indeed, a few days after the Blair decision, President Deemer suggested to his colleagues that they invite Scruggs to a meeting they had scheduled to discuss the question of the admission of Negroes to the state colleges. Scruggs, Deemer argued, could offer his opinion on how well the degree programs at Lincoln compared with those at the state colleges. In the end, Deemer suggested it might be in the interest of Lincoln that we not admit Negroes to the state colleges. However, President Parker countered, you know, I see little percentage in inviting President Scruggs to our next conference, it would be special pleading for him to say that Lincoln University courses or their curricula are the equivalent of those in our institutions. After the exchange of dozens of letters and consultations with their institutions, attorneys, and governing boards, the state college presidents were able to delay the desegregation of their institutions until 1954, when the Brown decision ordered it. Now, they may well have concluded there was no reasonable chance of success desegregating their colleges in a state where many, if not most, of the residents at mid-century opposed desegregation of all schools. Now, this is most clear in the debates that led to the approval of the new state constitution in 1945. In 42, the voters, by the way, we get to vote next week on whether we want to call another constitutional convention. In 1942, voters approved the calling of a constitutional convention. There were four college professors among the 83 delegates, but no teachers and no black delegates. They began their deliberations on September 21, 1943, and by early 44, it was clear that desegregation was, quote, the most controversial issue of the convention. The Urban League of St. Louis, the St. Louis Association of Colored Women's Clubs, and the Metropolitan Church Federation of St. Louis all called upon the delegates to desegregate public schools. Two education subcommittee members argued that there be no reference whatsoever to Negro schools in the Constitution. And then the committee voted by a narrow margin to eliminate segregated schools. Many clips like this existed in the state newspapers. Ultimately, however, the Education Committee and the Convention delegates decided to retain segregated schools as they feared that a change would cause voters to reject the entire document. Indeed, supporters worried about the impact of a, quote, whispering campaign begun by opponents to the proposed Constitution who falsely argued that should the new Constitution be adopted, white children will be compelled to attend the same schools with colored children. The only hope that delegates could offer in those, to those in favor of desegregation was a letter written by William Bradshaw, a political science professor at the University of Missouri. He noted in a letter to John Clark, who was the president of the St. Louis Urban League, that the delegates had added a critical phrase. While acknowledging that the new document stipulated that there would be separate schools for white and colored children, Bradshaw emphasized that the delegates had added, had added, except in cases otherwise provided by law. 
We have, Bradshaw argued, clearly opened the door for the gradual changing of policy. Indeed, in May of 1949, House members voted 100 to 8 to permit the desegregation of state colleges and universities. However, the bill never made it out of committee in the state Senate. Yet, the emphatic endorsement of the bill in the House represented the slow movement and sentiment towards desegregation evident in Missouri in the 1940s. This was a decade when Missouri newspapers published nearly 4,000 articles on segregation, many of them calling for its end. Significantly, as Gary and Tony Holland have pointed out in their book, the metropolitan newspapers in St. Louis and Kansas City, as well as the black newspapers of those cities, featured many editorials that advocated integrating the university. And between 44 and 49, private institutions, including the University of Kansas City, Webster College, St. Louis University, and Washington University began to admit black students. Indeed, St. Louis was in the vanguard of change. In 1944, the Cardinals and the Browns ended segregated seating at Sportsman's Park, the last major league city to do that. The city's five Catholic high schools began to admit black students, and some hotels accepted black students. There were examples elsewhere in the state, notably in Springfield, where in 1947, it opened a new Springfield Green County Library to all, regardless of race or color. And then regionally, some observers said Missouri was risking becoming a pariah state. A 1950 article in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch pointed out, around Missouri to the east, the north, and the west, there has been no segregation in collegiate education for many years. The University of Illinois, which does not even record whether a student is of the Negro race, estimated it enrolled 300 last term. There were 48 at the University of Nebraska, 128 at the University of Iowa, and 202 at the University of Kansas, 36 of whom came from Missouri. Moreover, in early 1950, there were 23 Negroes at the University of Oklahoma, 6 in professional study at the University of Arkansas, and 30 admitted to the University of Kentucky Graduate School. This left only the state of Tennessee, of all the states bordering Missouri that had not begun to desegregate. Then as one looks nationally, as James Endersby and William Horner call the positive atmosphere for civil rights pressed by President Harry Truman, one sees that momentum getting ever faster. Even though Truman was given to racial slurs and telling racist jokes, this grandson of slave owners became a powerful advocate for civil rights. He was the first president to make an address to the NAACP in 1947, speaking to that group from the Lincoln Memorial, in which he said, there is no justifiable reason for discrimination of ancestry or religion or race or color. He also appointed a 15-member Committee on Equal Rights, a committee that noted in its final report, we have not finally eliminated prejudice and discrimination from the operation of either public or private schools and colleges. In his 1948 State of the Union address, Truman called on Congress to address the reality that some of our citizens are still denied equal opportunity for education. And then later that year, Truman signed an executive order that desegregated the armed services. Now, as significant as that was, more Americans followed the remarkable story of Jackie Robinson. Jules Teigl, Robinson's most important biographer, pointed out Robinson's campaign against the color line in 1946 and 7 captured the imagination of millions of Americans who had previously ignored the nation's racial climate. Against the backdrop of Truman and Robinson's courage, there were examples of Missourians who took risks to combat segregation. In the face of significant opposition, John Elmer Ritter, shortly after his appointment as Archbishop of St. Louis in 1946, ordered the desegregation of the diocesan high schools. In 1950, as the University of Missouri and the state colleges struggled with the question of scheduling athletic contests with integrated teams, Bob Venetta, 
who was the head basketball coach at Central College, now Central Methodist, and the future coach at both Southwest Missouri State and the University of Missouri, scheduled at least one game each season against integrated teams. He thought his players would become more broad-minded after playing teams with Negro players in the roster. Then there's Alan E. Reynolds, who I mentioned a bit earlier. Reynolds, who served as president of the University of Missouri Board of Curators in 1948, took the initiative in lobbying with state legislators to pass laws requiring public institutions to admit Negro students. Had these seven presidents been willing to join in the movement to end segregation, college and university presidents could have drawn upon substantial support among their students and faculty. In polls taken between 1945 and 1950, at the University of Missouri, the Missouri School of Mines, Lincoln University, and Washington University, both students and faculty overwhelmingly supported desegregation, including 78% of the students in Rolla and 93% of the faculty in Columbia. As the exasperated editor of the Missouri Miner, the Missouri School of Mines school paper, pointed out in March 1950, it now seems that everyone is in favor of the admission of Negroes to the University of Missouri except the men who set the policy. Yet, what did college and university presidents in Missouri truly, truly believe about desegregation? In their study of the Gaines case, Andrews B. and Horner pointed out that Frederick Middlebush did not write about his views on integration. He was a native Michigander and a scholar devoted to teaching and learning he had no background suggesting opposition to the admission of black students to the University of Missouri. Walter Ryle, the president of Northeast Missouri State, told his fellow college president, the day is not far distant when there shall be no color line on the campuses of institutions of higher learning. Similarly, George Deemer at Central Missouri State wrote, personally, I have no objection to the admission of Negroes if it becomes a law of the state. Yet neither Ryle nor Deemer took any action to advocate this. Neither Walter Parker at Southeast Missouri State nor Roy Ellis at Southwest Missouri State directly indicated their views on desegregation other than it was a problem they had to deal with, one that Ellis worried would bring an infiltration of black students to his institution. Notably, neither Ryle nor Ellis even mentioned desegregation when they wrote the histories of their institutions long after they had become integrated. Well, historian Mark Russell has pointed out that despite all the challenges they faced, college and university presidents had the power to create a climate conducive to change. Indeed, in neighboring Arkansas, there was an example of a university president who took the initiative to desegregate his institution despite the fact that his governor, Ben Laney, was a staunch segregationist. While not ready to accept undergraduate students, University of Arkansas President Lewis Webster Jones, working with his board of trustees, quietly cultivated businessmen, newspaper editors, and civic leaders to support their initiative to desegregate the graduate and professional schools at the university. According to Harry Ashmore, the editor of the Arkansas Gazette, the success of this limited desegregation happened because, quote, the general public in Arkansas had already begun to acquire an unshakable respect for the judgment of their university president. None of the public, his, public higher education institutions in Missouri had gained such respect. Several historians of border and southern states have documented how presidents, regardless of their positions on desegregation, had to be mindful not only of residents of their state, but also state legislators and members of their governing boards who favored segregation as they considered how to best handle the issue. Given such daunting circumstances, the heads of public higher education institutions in Missouri chose not to be leaders. Instead, they opted to be followers, men who wanted to stay out of the spotlight, men who refused to take the initiative, and men who wanted nothing more than to carry out the orders of someone in authority above them. Their collective attitude was best captured in a letter from Walter Ryle to his fellow presidents. Now, while this topic is worth looking at through the lens of presidents, there's one group I've neglected, but I'm gonna take care of that neglect because we're gonna show you a, a short 
video of, a, of an interview that I got to do with the first of two African-American students at the Missouri School of Mines in 1950. His name is George Horn, and he graciously invited us into his home to let us do this video interview. The only problem with this interview is that he gets interrupted by an old windbag who tries to explain uh, the context for his remarks. When I was a senior at Sumner High School, I knew that I wanted to go to college. But where was I going to go to college? How was I going to get to college? My mother was a domestic. She made $3 a day plus a car fare. That was my encouragement. So that's why I accepted the challenge to enter into the suit with the NAACP to go to the School of Mines. In late 1949, when George Horn was considering going to college, there were really only two options for African-American students in the state of Missouri, Lincoln University in Jefferson City and Stowe Teachers College in St. Louis. The University of Missouri Board of Curators in 1949 had called upon state legislators to pass a law integrating public colleges and universities. And when that effort failed, the NAACP in Missouri decided to pursue a legal remedy. My neighbor was uh... His name was Dr. Curtis, and he knew that I was graduating from high school, and he asked me if I was interested in going to uh, engineering school. So evidently, looking at it back in those days, I think that he had a connection with the NAACP. A team of NAACP lawyers partnered with the University of Missouri Board of Curators in requesting a declaratory judgment from the Cole County Circuit Court. And in summer 1950, they got a judgment ordering the admission of George Horn and Elmer Bell Jr. to the Missouri School of Mines and Gus Ridgel to the graduate program in economics at the University of Missouri. And in late summer, Horn and Bell arrived in Rolla where they encountered the segregation and bigotry of the community. After we left there, the registrar's office, we went to the residence and put our luggage and belongings in the residence. Then we wanted something to eat. When we got to the restaurant, they refused to serve us. Then the dean called us back. Evidently, the restaurant called the dean. The dean called us back and told us that we could not, you know, frequent those places. And he would try to get somewhere for us to eat. The cafeteria wasn't open during that freshman orientation week. We had nowhere to eat but out of the grocery store. Got a can open. <laughs> they tried to help. They did as much as they could because they, they couldn't run the city or the things like that. They could only do things for the university. And they did what they could do. They were very helpful for trying to help, but they didn't solve all the problems. Even though Horn and Bell found professors who were very supportive during their first semester at the Missouri School of Mines, they grew weary of the bigotry of the Rolla community and of the racism of some of the white students, and they decided that they would transfer after their first semester. I, I, I'll say that the treatment, we weren't used to that type of treatment. Uh, we grew up in a black community, we had no say associated with whites that felt that way about blacks at that time. We couldn't understand it. I think we visited Columbia and we found that there was a large black community in Columbia. 
problems and we assembled right in that community. We had no problems at the end. I actually wanted to be a chemical engineer. And we stayed in Columbia until we got drafted. It was a slow process of integration. In the 50s, the campus never had more than six African-American students in any one year and did not have a graduate until 1956 when Silas Garrett graduated with a degree in, in physics. But there have to be pioneers to start an integration movement. And what we have here is one of the two pioneers of integration at the Missouri School of Mines and Metallurgy, George Horn. You look back and you say, what if I had stayed there? Where would I be now? And I don't think I would change anything. I think Ronald was a good experience for me. Even it wasn't fruitful for me, it was fruitful for others that came after me. So I did some good. Mm -hmm. So I'm willing to entertain questions or comments if you would like. Well, if you do have a question or comment, please wait till a microphone comes your way. I noticed that Lincoln was called Lincoln University, and the only other university was the University of Missouri. Was that a veiled attempt to be equal? Yes, they were both land-grant universities. Uh, the, the Lincoln University, it got that name in 19, I want to say 21, 22 through uh, state legislation. It would be the, the comparable school for African American students as Mizzou was for white students. But it wasn't really. It well, didn't, it, it, didn't it qualify in many ways when people tried to. Well, what we find in looking at the, the letters of the five college, state college presidents, they compared their curriculum with that at Lincoln, and they were very, very similar. So in that regard, uh, you're right. They, they, it largely was a um, teacher education school like the school in Springfield and Cape Girardeau and Warrensburg and in Kirksville and in Maryville. They dodged the issue. Mm -hmm. Question over there. Uh, you focused on uh, kind of 1950 at that time. Is there a university president in Missouri, say a little bit later, who you think showed courage in, in civil rights in, in the 50s or early 60s? Well, uh, the work done on the central Missouri state indicates that George Deemer, when he knew that the Brown decision was about to come down in 1954, he worked with his Board of Regents to be ready as soon as that decision came down to start the, the desegregation uh, process at Central Missouri State. I did get to interview, um, on a, for another reason, uh, former President Arthur Mallory at Southwest Missouri State. He was president from 1964 to 1971. And I asked him about this. And I said, well, was your campus accepting? Of, of African American students, and he said it was largely because the the college had gotten used to students of color from other nations. So it wasn't something that was brand new, and that would have been true at the University of Missouri as well. When the University of Missouri was not admitting uh, African American students born in the United States, they were accepting students of color from other countries. Over here. <laughs> Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think it's curious how um, Sherman Scruggs of Lincoln University spoke out for desegregation early on. Um, I just wonder what are your thoughts on that because it doesn't seem like that would have benefited Lincoln University given that probably you weren't going to get a big rush of white students coming to the school. And also, he stood to lose some of the black population in Missouri. So I, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on why he, 
he did that? Uh, first, you're right. In looking at all these letters that I've uh, taken some time to read, most of these five college, state college presidents believed this could be a detriment for Lincoln, particularly uh, at Central Missouri State because it was so close to Kansas City. But when I went through the, the, the president's papers at Lincoln University, Scruggs said, you, you've got to do the right thing. You know, the, the, we got a good institution here. It was, it was an extraordinary institution in the 1940s. They had hired an extraordinary faculty, and he thought they could hold up well against, uh, against the competition. Uh, I was curious, <clears throat> what was the uh, fate of the uh, of the the gentleman that you had the uh, interview with? What what did he end up doing um, after? Fort Horn? Yes. Great question. Uh, he and Bell got drafted. They went and served uh, in the Korean War. And when he came back, he said, uh, "You know, I wanted to be a chemist." So he was a chemist for a while for the, I think, I want to say the Food and Drug Administration, but his real ambition was, by the late 50s, was to go into the fire department in St. Louis. And he said what he faced in Rolla prepared him for what he faced in the fire department in St. Louis. There, was, there were separate firehouses for white and black firefighters, but he became known as one of the most aggressive and successful champions for equal rights in the St. Louis Fire Department. And when he retired, I believe he was second in command. So that, that spirit that you saw exhibited there, he just continued with it. Good question. About Elmer Bell Jr., I don't know. I never found Elmer Bell Jr. When I finished the, the article that, I, I, that came out in October of 21, I discovered he'd passed away. I wish I could have found him. I got to talk to Gus Ridgel, uh, the gentleman who came to to Mizzou, and when I shared with him what Horn said about coming to Columbia being a much more accepting place, Rigel said, well, what the hell was he talking about? He said, I wasn't accepted out, and I was in a small community of, of African Americans, but in the rest of Columbia, it wasn't any better. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Um, I know your talk tonight was focusing on college presidents and how they were involved in the issue. Um, but I wonder, similar to Concerned Student 1950, did you find uh, any evidence of student activism making any kind of impact on these college presidents or the, the Board of Regents? Great question, and yes, there was. <clears throat> uh, on the University of Missouri campus, absolutely, a number of different student newspapers became very strong advocates. Middlebush tried to censor uh, some of their work. Uh, a lot of protests. Same thing happened at uh, Southwest Missouri State. Uh, similarly, at the Missouri School of Mines in Rolla. Uh, the, the thing about the Rolla poll and what they bragged about, they said a higher percentage of students at the Missouri School of Mines favors desegregation than in the, quote, liberal campus up in, in Columbia. Uh, it wasn't enough to push these guys to, to change their position, but there was activism. And there's, there's another point I want to pursue after this, this topic. I'm, I'm so interested after listening to Horn. I want to know what it was like for every one of the first cohort of African-American students, whether they went to Northwest Missouri State or Southeast Missouri State, University of Missouri, wherever it was, I want to know, was Horn's situation unique or was it the common experience? So I don't know how successful I'm going to be, but that's, that's my next, next project. I know that the uh, first African-American student who graduated from Northwest Missouri State was a football player. He began in 1959, graduated in 1963. He said there had been other black players before him at Northwest, but they tended to play that first semester, and as he put it, they found out there were no black girls in Maryville, so they, they left. I, I'm, I'm going to guess that if I have success in finding these, these students, that their retention rate was probably pretty low because they walked into a circumstance they were, they were not ready for. I, I could be surprised by that. A recruiting of black players was uh, common. It was common, yeah. 
That sounds about right. Yeah. Way over there. So um, the University of Missouri, the Board of Curators got involved in the lawsuit um, to get the black um, students in the School of Mines, et cetera. Uh, was any other colleges, you know, uh, their boards involved in trying to desegregate and stuff? They got involved to stop desegregation. They said that Blair ruling only applied to the University of Missouri and to the Missouri School of Mines. There, there was no activist board member that I could find at the five state colleges. Maybe they silently advocated, but they didn't do it in letters and they didn't do it publicly. What was the impact uh, or what was the culture around faculty at the different universities and how did that relate to the presidents? As far as I could tell, most of the faculty were, were quite receptive. I know that there was a, a, a petition that was signed by several faculty members at Southwest Missouri State, but they didn't want their names publicized. But the leader of that effort, who was an English professor named uh, Haskell, said that he had, in his career he'd regretted he'd never been able to have uh, black students in his classes. Uh, but your, the second part of your question, what impact did that have on presidents? Faculty who became activists, and they were at Washington University, some at, at Mizzou, tried to push their leaders, very little success. Okay, uh, if you want to hang around and ask me a question one-on-one, I'll hang around up here as, as, as long as you want to talk. Thanks so much, Larry. Let's give him a round of applause. <laughs>